Hello and welcome. I'm delighted you've chosen to join us today as we embark on a new series, a new four-part series, where we're going to be looking at the pursuit of happiness. Yes, it's an important thing in our lives, isn't it? Happiness is a very, very important thing. In fact, it's probably mankind's quest from time immemorial, the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is something we desire deeply. However you're feeling today, uh, whether you are bereft of happiness at this moment in time or whether you are ecstatic, please bear with us because uh, we want to point you to the ultimate source of happiness the, and we'll distinguish between uh, different levels of happiness. But before we dip into that, let's just remind ourselves of some people who have pointed out how important this is in our, in our history. Um, if we go back to the 4th century AD, there was a very influential uh, chap called Augustine, Augustine of Hippo. He turned out to be, to be a bishop in the end. He was a bishop of uh, the, the church in North Africa, what we now know as Algeria. And he said this, every man whatsoever his condition desires to be happy. And then if we jump a few hundred years to the 13th century, another uh, very important churchman was called Thomas Aquinas. And, and he said this, man is unable not to wish to be happy. There's a double negative in there, so it takes a minute to get your head around that one, but I'll say it again. Man is unable not to wish to be happy. And then jumping forward again in history to a slightly more recent uh, time in the 17th century, uh, the French mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal said this, all men seek to be happy. This is without exception. Now, of course, they're talking about women too. So um, everybody, all mankind is seeking happiness. And if we jump to our present time, uh, you may uh, know of the fantastic philosopher Pharrell Williams, who said, clap along if you feel that happiness is the truth. <laughs> whatever, whatever. Um, we, want to, we want to look at this uh, more seriously and deeply, uh, what it means to, to be happy. Now, there's some science around this that wasn't available to the folks in those past times. Um, it's fairly recent science, and it is a, compil a compilation of information, of data, from hundreds and hundreds of studies on mankind's thinking and well-being. There was one particular psychologist who's been at the forefront of that. His name is Martin Seligman, and he is the father of what we now call positive psychology. There's a lot of very good stuff in there, but um, we're not going to have a science lesson or a, a philosophy, uh, a, a psychology lesson today. But we want to point out to the science because it is important to understand where we are coming from as human beings. We know, for example, that there is a distinction that is made between momentary happiness, you know, the temporary happiness that we get from uh, eating that chocolate eclair or having that beer or, you know, that m quick thing that is very, makes you feel good. But there's an enduring happiness, which is much more profound than that. And that's what we're looking at in this, uh, this uh, session today and over these four weeks. It's enduring happiness that human beings need. And how do we get that? How do we pursue that? Well, Here's the science around it. What they've discovered is that, and this is quite interesting, but quite um, can be downhearting in a way. Uh, half of our happiness comes from a basal state that is determined by our genetics. Yep, we're kind of hardwired uh, to have a certain level of happiness in our lives. And some people are hardwired to have to be a little bit more happy in their nature than others, and some are a little bit less happy than others. So there's a kind of basal state. And if you were to have 
a, a fantastic experience that made you deliriously happy. Uh, the, it would last for a while, but then you would steadily come down and reach your st steady state. The other elements, and this one's quite surprising, is one of them is our circumstances. As it turns out, and this is universally agreed by all the psychologists, our circumstances are responsible for only 8 to 15% of our happiness state. Yep, eight to 15%. So the balance of our happiness comes from somewhere else. And that balance, which is up to 42%, it's a significant amount, is around our choices. It's the voluntary part of how we, at how we attack life, how we interact with our living conditions. So that 42% is the bit where we can have a profound effect. So that's where we want to look at really today in particular. But um, in order to do this, we want to find a, a real source of truth and reliability. So I want to point you to a, a part of the Bible which gives us huge insight into all of this. We're going to look at the book of uh, the letter that Paul wrote. Paul, you know, Paul the missionary who spread the word of the gospel all over Europe in, uh, at that early in those early days in that first century, and he wrote to a group of people that lived in Philippi, which is in northern Greece. Uh, it's not far from the coast up, up there in northern Greece, uh, but it is a bit inland. And Philippi was a place where uh, there was a kind of centre point of communication. It was a route uh, and there was lots of different uh, nationalities there. But the Philippians were a special group because it was part of the Roman Empire, but they were given special status. They, they were called a colony. So they must have done something right. Uh, the Romans liked them. So the Philippians were this group of Christians that Paul wrote to. And this letter is a source of great joy. It's the, probably the happiest of the books of, this, of the New Testament, of the, certainly of the letters. It's the most positive and uplifting. So we're going to start there uh, uh, in chapter one. And I want to tell you a little bit about Paul's circumstances. He was in jail. OK, so it's not the first time he found himself in jail uh, and he found himself in jail. Uh, for a protracted period. We're not quite sure when this was, but it was probably late on. This is how he addresses the Philippians. So let's go to Philippians chapter one, and this is verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. This man is in chains, right? He's chained to jailers and he's there for years. And he's saying to the people he's writing to, uh, this is OK because it's actually made the gospel spread further. And he's talking about the jailers and all the people in the, in the palace guard who are looking after him. Um, they all know that he is a Christian. They know about his message and it's having an impact on them. So the advancement of the gospel is coming out even when he's in jail. Uh, why is he in jail? It reminded me of uh, a story in, in Porridge, if you watch that series, a fantastic little conversation between Fletch and uh, his cellmate Godber when they, when they were first uh, in together. And Godber says, what are you in for? And uh, Fletcher says, I'm in for my beliefs. Oh, uh, God was said, what, what's that? He said, I believed I wouldn't get caught. <laughs> well, that's not what happened to Paul. Paul was in for his beliefs, but it was because his beliefs were upsetting the, the hierarchy. They, they were causing some controversy in society at large because there were profoundly different views. Um, and... Uh, they were disturbing views to, to the Romans, particularly. So he found himself in jail again. 
uh, for his beliefs. <clears throat> but listen to what he says uh, a little further on in the letter. This is verse, verses 18 to 19. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. That word deliverance can also read salvation. So he is using terms about re of rejoicing. Now, I'm not sure I would be feeling like rejoicing if I was in the, in the jail. Um, and yet here he is. And this letter is full of beauty and positivity and love for these Philippians. Um, why is that? Why is that? Two other examples that um, have come to mind when I was watching a couple of television programs recently and something, you no, know, one was a book, one was from a book, a story uh, of this uh, chap, Greg Mortensen, who was a uh, uh, who has been working in Pakistan for decades, building schools for the children in remote areas. Now, Greg was having a conversation with one of the old guys in, in the tribe in the village. Now, this, this village was totally remote, up in the mountain range just before the Himalayas, just to the west of the Himalayas. And these people lived very, very difficult lives. They had, they had just enough food of a very, very basic kind, but they had very little else. And Greg said, what makes you happy? Because they were happy people. And the old man said, whatever God gives me, makes me happy. Whatever God gives me, makes me happy. And then in a completely different part of the world, I was watching a, a Rick Stein program. I, I, I love food, so I tend to watch a lot of cookery programs or food programs. So Rick Stein was in France, and he was in this remote place in France, up the mountains again. Um, and he was overwhelmed by the happiness of the people there. Now, they had a simple life as well. They weren't poor like the people in, uh, desperately poor like the people in, in Pakistan, but they were relatively poor and had this joyous relationship among them in, in the family. And again, Rick asked the question, why are you so happy? And again, it was the old man who just did this, he pointed up. Now, Rick wondered if he was pointing to the sky because the weather was so nice. Um, the crew apparently said, he was talking to about the bedroom upstairs, but that, that's that's typical of the crew. So no, the old man was therefore able to explain. No, he meant he was pointing to God. God was his source, their source of happiness. Uh, and you know that's that's where we're coming from here. That's what this this gospel letter is all about. That's what Paul was all about. So Paul says this again, right at the start, this is the beginning of the letter uh, after the greeting. Paul goes, uh, says this in verses three to six. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. The source of joy and happiness in all of this was God himself through Jesus. And it was the spirit of Jesus that enabled Paul to be like this and to fill the Philippians with that kind of uh, wonder and joy and happiness um, because they were impacted by that. And they are praised throughout this letter for the way in which they live. And we'll get to that as, as, as the weeks go on. But I wanted just to focus today on where this all begins. And it begins, as Paul's letter does, with gratitude. Do you know the choices bit that we have in where our happiness comes from? Our choice can be to choose the main source, the only true source 
of happiness, and that is God. Now, should, should it be a surprise to us that the ultimate source of happiness is our creator, who made us to be like that? Jesus himself said, I, I have come to bring you life that you might have it more abundantly. We are meant to be happy people. God is the happiest being in the universe. He has created us to be happy. Uh, we mess up. Um, and we have a choice. We can choose to be grateful. Because that's, that was the secret of those remote peoples in Pakistan, in, in, in France, in anywhere in the world you choose to go. You will find that where you find true happiness... There is often very little material wealth, very little in any way of the kinds of things that we seek in the West. But yet their source is their creator. The simple truth is the God who made them is their source of happiness. And it can be yours and mine. Gratitude is where it starts. An attitude of gratitude, because every time you find that there is thanksgiving, you will find joy. Where you find grumbling, you will find the opposite. So when you see the advert on the telly telling you that uh, you'll be happy if you buy this car, or if you do use this shampoo, or if you go to this place on holiday, there may be an element of truth in the fact that it will bring you some happiness for a moment, but it's never going to be the source of happiness that you're looking for. And, you know, our society is the deep, most deeply unhappy society. And I'm talking about Western society here in America and in Europe, that the wealthy places where we've had life as easy uh, as it has been. We are the unhappiest of people. We struggle with this quest for happiness and we find it, we think, in all these other things. If only I had more of this, if only I could do this, I'll be happy. It doesn't work. We all know that, but we're getting sick with it, with this worry and with this burden of unhappiness because we're looking in the wrong places. May I encourage you to delve into these scriptures, these, look at this, this wonderful letter, look at the beauty of the relationship. Because you see, one of the secrets again of happiness in our choices is how we build relationships. And we find that people who have lots of good, strong, uh, healthy relationships with other people have deeper happiness longer lasting happiness. So if you're looking for enduring happiness, there is no other source in the universe other than our creator God for enduring happiness. No other source. You'll find happy things in other places, but they're temporary. Enduring happiness comes when we realize that our future our past, our present, and our future is in God's hands. That when we trust him, even if circumstances are dire, ultimately, when we trust him, he brings that joy and that happiness. And I pray that that will be your discovery today and that I will discover it more than I have now. So, would you pray with me and uh, we'll just ask for, for a blessing that, that God might help us to find this happiness. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of joy and happiness. Even if we've got a picture of you that is completely different, we can see if we look at the scriptures you have provided with us, if we look at Jesus' life, if we look at the lives of those who are filled with your Holy Spirit, we can see that you are a joyful God and that you want that for us. We would pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us seek you, that we might have true happiness, that we might have enduring happiness, that we would not put our trust in things of the world, but we would put our trust in you. And in so doing, discover 
that our whole future forever is in safe hands. Uh, we ask it in Jesus' name. So thank you for being with us today again, and I pray that you will have a joy-filled joy week and that we will become a nation of joyful people because we find the real source of that happiness.